This is CBC Here and Now. Four days of potential uh, disruptions to our service, of course, will have an impact. It's always challenging when, you know, the boats are not getting in. A storm system that will keep the ferries tied up. We'll look at what that means for restaurants and grocery stores and still with Marine Atlantic. No doubt that they don't want to go, but uh, frankly, I don't care. I do not care. Could its headquarters move from St. John's to port basque And would workers want to move there? The town's MHA says Marine Atlantic's cost would be cheaper if it moved to the West Coast. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. You might want to visit your nearest grocery store and soon. With some bad weather on the way, Marine Atlantic says its ferries could be tied up until after the weekend. That means trucks can't get across from Nova Scotia. Here now is Meg Roberts joins us live. Meg? Well, it's not exactly nice out right now. I can't even really tell if it's raining or snowing. It doesn't look like the weather is going to get any better anytime soon. Marine Atlantic says that people can expect delays in the ferry services, which might leave shelves and grocery stores like this one looking a little bare. Due to high winds, Marine Atlantic says people can expect delays to start tomorrow and run until Monday. The Crown Corporation says it carries about 50% of the island's fresh foods into the province, so it wanted to get the message out to residents and clients as soon as possible. When we're shut down for an extended period of time, there is an impact. Uh, you start to see that fairly quickly uh, for some of the products that, that, that are into the supermarkets. So uh, we try to resume operations as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, unfortunately, with this weather system, it's a, it's a possible four-day system, which is, is longer than we're used to. One local restaurant says the potential shortage might be a challenge for the menu this coming week. But executive chef of the Merchant Tavern says the restaurant tries to use as many local products as possible. Still, so much of the ingredients are shipped here. Uh, you live in an island isolated from the rest of the country and, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're in a situation where we depend on, uh, you know, food from outside the province, which is something I think that we need to, again, draw awareness to and support local and uh, be going back to our gardens and farmers and, uh, you know, supporting ourselves. Now, I know there's a trend in this province about people stocking up before a storm, leaving shelves empty, but the good news is not everyone is concerned about a potential food shortage. I spoke to an employee at Coleman's. Uh, he says that they received a shipment in earlier today, and in preparation, they're also receiving another shipment tonight. So he says they're in pretty good shape with the bad weather approaching. Now, there's no one better to speak to us about bad weather than Ashley, and she's going to walk us through what exactly we're in for this weekend. That's right. Uh, I'm As we head through the next 24 to 36 hours, as I mentioned, a little bit of a mess. So we've got rainfall warnings in place already along the south coast. 20 to 40 millimeters is possible. Then that wind warning, which Meg was talking about, 100 kilometer per hour winds are expected tomorrow afternoon. And the winds are going to stay strong right through the weekend. Uh, it's going to be a mess up through Labrador as well. Mainly a snow event, though. So snow, snow, snowfall warning in place for Labrador City and then uh, down along the coast as well from Nain to Makovic. Now taking a look at the future tracker, things will start to move in for Labrador as we head through the day tomorrow. That's when that snow moves in. By the time the afternoon rolls around tomorrow, we'll even start to see a changeover through southwestern portions of the island. And then eventually we're going to see that spread across the rest of the island. Now that system continues to track a little bit further north. In behind that, those winds really pick up and that's the problem. And we're going to see those winds and snow squalls right through the weekend. So I'll have more details when I come back. Deb? Thanks, Ashley. Well, CBC has learned it's possible the corporate headquarters for Marine Atlantic might be setting sail out of St. John's. And in a sign of just how sensitive this issue is, Marine Atlantic leadership has completely buttoned up. While political leaders in Porta Basque believe an ongoing review might put some economic wind at their backs. Here and as Terry Roberts reports. Marine Atlantic is the lifeline for most of the goods entering this province and thousands of passengers traveling between Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And it's here where most of the action takes place, Porto Basque. But the headquarters is located here, 
in this downtown St. John's building, 900 kilometers away. But a review has quietly been underway for months to determine whether it would be viable to relocate the 20 plus staff in St. John's to Port of Basque. From Marine Atlantic's perspective right now, uh, we're not prepared to offer any, uh, any comment on, uh, on that issue. So no one at Marine Atlantic are talking publicly, including board chairman and Port of Basque native Christopher Parsons. But his brother, Virgil Lapoil MHA Andrew Parsons, sure is. I think there's an economic case to be made that the work can be done there and could, can be done cheaper, and that is going to result in savings for everybody that needs it. I'm hearing that employees here in St. John's are on edge, worried they'll have to choose between relocating with their families to Port Basque or abandoning their careers altogether with Marine Atlantic, while Andrew Parsons has no sympathy. No doubt that they don't want to go, but uh, frankly, I don't care. I do not care. I think that's a baloney argument saying recruitment retention. The fact is that's an argument because they don't want to move, so I would say too bad. So a lot of questions with no answers. No idea, for example, when this review will conclude. No idea whether it will mean savings and whether employees will even relocate if it comes to that. It's all about as uncertain right now as the weather in the Cabot Strait. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. A man was killed in a single vehicle crash near St. John's last night. It happened on the Trans-Canada Highway near Cochrane Pond. Holyroot Holy RCMP rather, were called to the scene at around 9 o'clock. The lone occupant of the vehicle, a 22-year-old man from Carboneer, was pronounced dead at the scene. And that investigation continues. Some video to show you now of what could have been a serious crash. This is yesterday along the Veterans Memorial Highway. That black car is driving up the exit ramp, going the wrong way. As it approaches the highway, the car merges onto it from the wrong side, crossing over double yellow lines. The Veterans Memorial Highway has been the scene of several deadly crashes over the last few years. And now to the courts where members of the Al Potter jury were shown the alleged murder weapon today. The court also got a glimpse into the RCMP's investigations in the days following the vicious stabbing that happened in North River. Here now is Ariana Kellen is covering the trial and has this report. A three inch blade, one inch wide, discovered according to police in a freshwater stream in Brigus. It was documented by Corporal Kelly Lee, the officer in charge of photographing the autopsy photos of numerous wounds that clearly disturbed the jury and upset Dale Porter's family. Porter's shirt and the holes in it give an idea of the trauma he sustained. A week after Porter's death, RCMP got inside this former garage turned biker clubhouse in Cupid's. Covered windows shielded outside eyes from the motorcycle's bar and Viking's vest that lay inside. It was there that blood was found, filed and tested. This lighter in a bag behind a furnace, blood stains on the back. Samples also taken from this vest, shown to the jury today. And blood was found here, inside a Birch Hill taxi from Bay Roberts, which police believe transported Porter's two killers. The results of all this DNA testing, the jury has yet to hear. We also learned today that Al Potter was arrested in relation to the slaying shortly after Porter died. While in custody, police got a warrant to test his clothing too. He wasn't charged then, but was arrested two years later. Today, his lawyer pointing to drugs, cocaine, found in the victim's house and on his person. Potter's lawyer also questioning the amount of time between the alleged murder and the raid on the clubhouse. The Crown says Porter was targeted for disrespecting the motorcycle club and told the jury to anticipate hearing from friends of the victim. That testimony is to come. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. New research shows that looking after your heart could have big benefits for your brain. A study released today by the Heart and Stroke Foundation is drawing a link between heart health and the possibility of developing dementia. The study looked at more than two and a half million cases of Canadians hospitalized with cardiovascular disease. This researcher with Munn's Faculty of Medicine says it's a wake-up call for people in this province and shows a deeper link between the disease and the risk of vascular cognitive impairment. 
possibly dementia. Dr. Michelle Plowman says more and more people in their 30s are experiencing heart problems, and that a quarter of the population has high blood pressure, one-fifth smoke, and 65% are overweight. It seems like it's not going to happen to me. I think many people think this won't happen to me. I know this person who's lived to 90, this person who smoked and did everything lived to 90. But the reality is that these factors accumulate. The more you have of them, uh, the more you're setting yourself up for dementia. And I don't think anybody wants to see themselves institutionalized at 65 or 70 years old. Well, that record-breaking lockout at DJ Composites in Gander never ended for some union workers. Only 14 are back on the floor today, while others say that they have been left out in the cold. Here now is Garrett Barry is live with us tonight. So, Garrett, take us through this story. Well, Anthony, you'll probably remember this, the big blockade, union-driven blockade at the DJ Composites plant last September into October. And the union celebrated when they brought the company, DJ Composites, to a binding arbitration agreement. Well, now one veteran worker says this was all for naught, at least for her. Maureen Reed stood on that picket line for two years. So, so, so! so but she'd never got back inside. So she's polishing off her resume, looking for a new job after 16 years. I never imagined it would turn out this way. I thought there would have been jobs for us all, or if not jobs for us all, at least we would have gotten a pay in lieu of notice to at least get us through till we found other employment or got called back. When DJ agreed to binding arbitration, Unifor was thrilled. Nice. Two months later, an arbitrator sided with the company, and that meant layoffs. No job, no income, no EI, no benefits. It's like we were thrown to the curb. She says she's been let down by everyone, including Unifor. I spent my Christmas believing the union had my back. She's next on the list to be called back into the factory, but she says hope doesn't pay the bills. She wants the union to do more to help those who have been left behind. It just seems really unfair to me that uh, a big union like Unifor couldn't help 11 people to, to aid them for a month or two after all, after it was all said and done. Clear how many people are in that same boat waiting for that call to go back into the factory. When this lockout began more than two years ago, there were more than 30 people inside the bargaining unit. But as time went by, a lot of people dropped out. They needed to look for other jobs, and the time that it took was a big reason why. We also know that even now people are still looking for other work, but Reed says there's several people who are still waiting for that call, just like her and there are several people still really upset with how this all went down. All right, Garrett, you've been on top of the story from the beginning. What is Unifor saying about what happened? There's really two issues that play here. First, about the layoffs. Well, Lana Payne is the Atlantic director for Unifor and a frequent voice in this story, and she said it's been clear for everyone involved that layoffs were likely, maybe even on the horizon, and she said the union members knew about this because they were talking about it as early as 2017. Still, she says it was the right decision to go to a binding arbitrator. And in the end, we have a collective agreement. We have people back to work. We have protected and have recall rights for folks who wouldn't have had those had we not been able to achieve this agreement through arbitration. So yes, I mean, the alternative would have been disastrous. Uh, nobody would have had a job in that facility. Second issue here about some form of severance pay or transitional pay. Well, Payne says that what Reed is asking for, her proposal, just isn't realistic. She says no union does this kind of thing, and there's a good reason. If the lockout pay continued into well after the collective bargaining agreement was signed, then the strike, for, the strike fund, rather, the defense fund, would be depleted rather quickly. So Payne says her priority right now is to get more work inside the facility to work with DJ Composites, and that might would bring people back into the factory and might even bring Reed back into the factory, back at her old job. Reporting live for Here Now in Gander, I'm Garrett Berry. If you're a teacher with a sense of adventure, there's somebody here at Memorial University who's interested in you. 
So if you like the outdoors and the wilderness and the tight-knit community, Natwashish is the place that you want to teach. Find out about a recruitment drive, that's next. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. We saw earlier in the show a possibility. It'll take a while to get some stuff here. I know. So look out tomorrow well, <laughs> in do. the grocery right. stores. Yeah. We really do have a mess coming, don't we? Yeah, we certainly do. Uh, quiet tonight, though, so that's the good news. Those temperatures, though, this afternoon, uh, quite cold right across the board. Taking a look at those temperatures, sitting uh, right now in the minus single digits. That's about where we were sitting uh, yesterday around this time of the evening, but things are about to change as I just mentioned. Now here's uh, a look at the satellite and radar. We are seeing some snow moving through uh, the Avalon tonight and that will quickly move out and then we're seeing actually some clearing in behind. So we'll see that uh, trend continue through the night tonight. Temperatures generally in the minus teens uh, along the west coast again towards coastal areas though right along the coast those temperatures will be a couple of degrees warmer. Port of Ass sitting at minus 4 tonight, minus 13 
leading for Marystown, and then the Avalon sitting in the minus single digits, so around minus five tonight with those winds eventually easing, which is definitely uh, good news. And then up through Labrador, we're looking at uh, clear skies for the most part, minus 22 for Lab City and minus 20 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. But again, under clear skies, that snow will move in as we head through the day tomorrow. So uh, quickly, if you missed it, here's a look at the watches and warnings right now. Wind warning for Rec House, wind warning for Port Basque. Uh, rather for the rec house area with gusts near 100 kilometers per hour tomorrow afternoon in those southeast winds wind shift and then we should see that uh, warning end. Otherwise rainfall warnings along the south coast and southern Avalon could pick up 20 to 40 millimeters of rain and then that snowfall warning in place for Lab City tomorrow. And then up uh, through Nain to Makovic, we're looking at winter storm watches that will likely change to a winter storm warning. But taking a look at the future tracker, we can see that snow move in for uh, Labrador tomorrow morning. By the time the afternoon rolls around, temperatures will be hovering around the zero degree mark for Port Basque, and then things will change over to freezing rain. And you can see I added temperatures to this map. Temperatures will climb through the overnight, which means everything should change over to rain by the time uh, midnight rolls around, certainly for Central and the Avalon. But again, though, the most rain will fall along the south coast. So 20 to 40 millimeters, but then you're also looking at about two to five millimeters of uh, ice with that as well. And that's essentially the story for most of Newfoundland, mostly snow for the northern peninsula. So 15 to 25 centimeters, and that's the case up through Labrador as well. Central areas we will see closer to a trace, maybe five centimeters of a snow ice pellet mixture before we start to see that changeover. So here's a look at the temperatures for tomorrow, sitting between zero and minus two for most of the Avalon and eastern uh, Newfoundland. Those winds out of the southeast, again, quite breezy between 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Similar temperatures uh, through parts of central and the northeast coast. And then there's the uh, mess in the afternoon. Temperatures hovering around the zero degree mark. That's why we'll see that freezing rain. Southeast winds upwards of about 60 kilometers per hour. Northern Peninsula will see 15 to 20 centimeters of snow. And with windy conditions, we're looking at blowing snow through the day. Those temperatures generally hovering around the minus single digits. And then lots of snow for Labrador. The strongest winds will actually be as we head towards the weekend. And then we'll see some snow and blowing snow with that system as well. I'll have all those details when I come back. Well, we're here at Munn's Faculty of Education. There's some interesting recruitment going on. So, Rena, what are you doing here? We are recruiting, actively recruiting teachers for our Natwishu School, and we're also presently taking um, applications for our fall. Okay, and uh, I've seen the papers. Quite a few teachers you need. So, tell me a bit about your school. Our schools um, in Natwishu is probably a school population of 280. Mm -hmm. And I saw you, you're looking for six teachers? Yes, six teachers and three IRT positions. That's special use. People know it as special education. That's right. So for people with special needs. Yes. Okay. That's a lot of teachers and staff for a school of 280. Why, why do you need so many people? Um, just because we have a turnover rate and not everybody can deal with the north. So the remoteness of, does play a factor. All right, so if there are graduates, young people who want to be teachers and they're interested in actually working there, what do you tell them? Do you give them some kind of warning or advice? Do you say, hey, listen, this isn't for everybody? How do you convince them that Natwashish is the place for them? Well, I think if they have a sense of adventure, you kind of get that off the top. Um, you have to love the outdoors if you want to be in Natwashish. Um, it's just the scenery, the love of the land, um, the culture, um, the people, the community. It's just a tight knit. Um, family. Right, and when it comes to certain benefits, like, do people say, well, where am I going to live? How am I going to actually, do, is there any? We actually provide housing for our teachers. Um, it's at a minimal cost. It has Wi-Fi, um, satellite, uh, telephone, at a really, really reasonable rate. All right, now as you know, uh, people of a certain generation remember stories from Natwashish which weren't exactly uplifting. Is, is that a problem? I mean, people Google your school because they want to yeah, like anything, you're gonna get, you're gonna go on Google or in other search engines. You are gonna come up with some negative stories, but we like to focus on the success of our students. So that is our main priority. Um, we have a growing graduation rate with our students in both of our schools in Natoshish and Shadji. You mean they're staying in school? They're staying in school. They're completing their education and going on to post secondary. Okay. Well, listen, uh, it's obviously a bit of a challenge. Um, good luck. I, I hope it goes well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, Rena mentioned a number of teaching and support positions. So K through grade three, you've got some positions there. Grade seven, a number of special needs positions as well. And if you're interested, you can contact Rena Panashaway. Her email, rpanashawe at inueducation.ca. Well, from one school to another, talking about race, religion, and sexuality, well, that can be tough. But students at St. Andrews Elementary are learning how to celebrate each other's differences this week. Yes, and as uh, here now Zach Gowdy reports, diversity is something these kids already know a lot about. Like all students, kids at St. Andrews Elementary study math, science, and history. But this week, they're learning about a very special subject. Quick question, who do you think is Canadian here among all three of us? Okay, we'll do, we'll do it this way. How many of you think Mohammed is Canadian? Today, the Association for New Canadians is giving a talk on cultural diversity, one of several topics being covered during Diversity Week at St. Andrews. So why do you, do you think that Mohammed is Canadian? His skin color. Skin color? It's the kind of talk that could make adults squirm, but not these kids. We're learning about how people are different in all kinds of different ways. What are some of the ways people are different? Um, like their skin color, their clothes. I learn uh, like you can, you can love whoever you want, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if if uh, you have like brown skin, white skin. A wide variety of clothes and skin colors is something students here are used to. As a center city school close to Memorial University, St. Andrews has one of the most diverse student populations in the province. A map in the foyer shows the many different countries where students and their families come from. Do you think you're all very fortunate to be in a safe country? Yeah. Yes, so if we see people coming from other countries that are not safe, do you think we should laugh at them? No. It's my first time coming to the school, and the first group that came, the kindergarten school, I was like, whoa, this is such a diverse classroom. So they are at an advantage compared to maybe other schools because they're meeting and interacting with people from different parts of the world. Each day this week has a different theme. Monday began with a Pink Day assembly and focused on LGBTQ issues. Groups including Planned Parenthood, Easter Seals, Foster Families Association, and the Autism Society have also done presentations. Is it sometimes uncomfortable to ask people about their different skin color or their different beliefs or the different parts of the world they or their families may be from? Yes. Why is that, Mike? Because it's really personal to them and I don't really want to make them sad about it. Have we heard of refugees? No. no. Rather than shy away from these subjects, teachers at St. Andrews want students to be proud of the diversity they see all around them. It's their normal, so they don't really see it as a big deal or an actual difference. I think it really has to start early and it's our job as teachers to teach the next generation to accept everybody. It's a lesson these students have taken to heart. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. The students are really paying attention, they're engaged. Uh, they yeah. absolutely are. The school is very forward thinking, very progressive when it comes to um, this topic. So mm -hmm. good, good on them. Yeah. Derek was an amazing artist, mostly as a working with him in the art department on films. There was nothing he couldn't do. Friends and colleagues gather to remember artist Derek Holmes. That's next.
Welcome back. You may not recognize his face, but you've certainly seen his artwork in St. John's or in many of the local film and television projects done here over the last 30 years. Derek Holmes died on Sunday. He was 59. Now, Holmes created some of the large murals sprinkled throughout the city near Cape Spear, throughout downtown and the Battery. And some of his friends gathered at one of those murals downtown to talk about what Derek meant to them. Derek was an amazing artist, mostly as a working with him in the art department on films. There was nothing he couldn't do. He could make spider webs and he could make murals. It was like, give him anything. It was like, make this piece of wood look like a treasure chest and he would do it in a minute. He was just so incredibly talented as an artist. Had you ever encountered anybody like that no. before to that level? Not with the patience he had because I would ask him to do the weirdest things and he could do it. He was just so much talent. Um, you know, and he was so skilled, um, certainly, uh, if you look at some of the sets in Frontier, uh, uh, for example, beautiful, opulent pieces, created marble and gold and statues, and it was all done out of his eye. Um, and he was a great team player. His t crew is truly going to miss him. He was a great leader and a wonderful collaborator. He was a super competitive guy. He loved to win. He Actually, he was fierce about it. but. But off the ice, he was the complete opposite. He was completely laissez-faire, live and let live. He, he didn't ever want to push people aside to get ahead. He was definitely a great friend and teammate. Um, I mean, we he played at the highest levels of competitive softball in the city for years, ball hockey, played national uh, level ball hockey. And when he played with us, we were just a bunch of rec hockey players, and we used to go to tournaments, and he would always be the guy who lifted us up because his level of skill was so much higher than ours. But off the ice, you know, after a, a skate, you know, we'd spend hours sometimes just sitting in the rink and having a beer and chatting about life, and, uh, you know, those are the moments that I'll treasure for, for the rest of my life. With his work ethic, um, with all of the shows that we've done since then, um, he's been like that, you know, always giving everything of himself and um, making the work uh, exceptional, making everybody who's involved with it look good. And uh, yeah, he was just a really, really steady um, person, you know, a really good friend, always, uh, you know, patient when you meet him to stop and have a little chat, um, but still get everything done at an unbelievably high level. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll sorely miss his professionalism, but also miss the man, you know, the person who was, you know, truly a special guy. Derek was a, a big fan of our band, Smokestack Lightning, and we played his wedding with, for him for Nula a few years back. But I remember way back when uh, we played with Pressure Drop, and I think it was our first time we went to Gander, and we played the Flyers Club. We sold out, but nobody told us that people in Gander don't clap. So we, we got up and I, we played the first song, and the place was blocked and you could hear a pin drop at the end of the at the end of the song. We played another song, same thing, the band was tight, we were right on our mark, and you could hear a pin drop, there's no reaction from the crowd. And Derek, who had come out with us on that road trip and we'd been priming before the show, Derek from the back of the room shouted out, Play something they know, Stoney, before they kill us all. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going, that's not gonna help, but it was we always shared a good laugh after that. When he did the murals, which obviously all of the public get to enjoy, uh, um, he used archival footage, stuff that was really from the community, um, and that was the basis of the work that he did. And public art is a strange one because, you know, they come and they go. He did some beautiful ones. The Golden Pheasant certainly was a beautiful one that was done. Of course, that building is gone, Hamilton Avenue. But we see the one here in the Battery, which is extremely reflective of the life of uh, the history and the life in the Battery here. Uh, the one on Duckworth Street as well, some local characters. Um, it just leaves a beautiful feeling of, of history of this place and, uh, and a part of him. We should mention that Derek Holmes is the father of our very own Chrissy Holmes, the host of the St. John's Morning Show, and of course someone uh, you are familiar with through her time on our show. Mm, so certainly everybody here at CBC, uh, we offer our condolences to Chrissy and her family. 
Well, to Toronto, where the Toronto Maple Leafs paid tribute to Newfoundland's legendary broadcaster, Bob Cole. That was last night. A video honoring the 85-year-old play-by-play icon was shown on the jumbo screen during the first period of the Battle of Ontario, Toronto versus the Ottawa Senators. Ladies and gentlemen, please join the Ottawa Senators and the Toronto Maple Leafs in congratulating Bob on 50 amazing years. As you can see, the tribute drew a standing ovation to the strains of Frank Sinatra's My Way, Cole's favorite singer, by the way. This is Cole's 50th and last season on Hockey Night in Canada. His final Hockey Night in Canada broadcast will be the regular season finale between the Leafs and Montreal Canadiens at the Bell Centre April 6th. Some of you may even remember that Bob Cole hosted Here and Now back in the late 60s and early 70s. Well, some people from this province received nominations today for the Canadian Screen Awards. Just don't stop, please. Alan Hocko has been nominated for Best Actor and for Best Writing for the TV show Caught. That show aired on CBC last year. Caught is also nominated for Best Limited Series. Other awards too. Comedian Johnny Harris and his show Still Standing is nominated for three awards. Filmmaker and director Jordan Canning is nominated for Best Direction for her work with the CBC comedy Baroness Von Sketch Show. A documentary by Kenneth Harvey and Christopher Pratt called Immaculate Memories, The Uncluttered Worlds of Christopher Pratt. Well, that has been nominated for Best Feature Length Documentary. And filmmaker Jamie Miller, originally from this province, has been nominated for Best Short Documentary. That's something that she was on here and now about, telling us about a young dancer who lost his arms after a devastating fire in Toronto. And Michael Rowe was nominated for his lead role in the feature film Crown and Anchor. To comedy, This Hour Has 22 Minutes has been nominated for Best Sketch Comedy. And most of the cast on that show, as you probably know, are from this province. And Mary Walsh is being honored by the Academy She's received a nomination for Best Actress for her work in the Hatching, Matching and Dispatching Christmas Special. And she will also receive a special award from the Academy, the Earl Grey Award. That recognizes her body of work over the course of her entire remarkable career. Well, congratulations to yeah. all the nominees. That's a whole lot of talent oh, that sure you just is. talked about. Yeah. One case, actually, that someone threw a shovel at the snow plows that was going by their street. Crews in Grand Falls, Windsor are battling more than just the snow. Angry homeowners are slinging insults and shovels at drivers? Come on! That's next.
They once called it the capital of Labrador, Battle Harbor, the former fishing premises that's found a future in tourism. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Snowplow operators in Grand Falls, Windsor are getting a rough ride on the job, not because of potholes or poor road conditions, but because they're being bullied and harassed by homeowners, according to the town. And Deputy Mayor Mike Brown joins us from the municipal offices. So, Deputy Mayor, the town says there are troubling levels of bullying and harassment against these plow operators. Sounds bad. What's actually happening? Well, during the hours of uh, snow clearing, whether it be daytime or even nighttime, uh, some residents are, get, uh, are not pleased with the way the roads are being tended to. And for whatever reason, they think to solve the issue would be a good idea to flag the operator down and, and run alongside of that heavy piece of equipment. And uh, certainly a dangerous practice for both our operators and for our residents. And I imagine these are choice words they're hurling at them, are they? Yeah, there's some verbal assaults as well as some uh, unfriendly gestures uh, mm -hmm. towards our uh, snowplow operators. And in one, one, one case, actually, there's someone threw a shovel at the snowplows that was going by their street. So uh, not very nice, uh, uh, not very nice to, for our residents to be doing that. And uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's not many. I think we've had a dozen incidents so far this uh, winter where that has happened. So we certainly need to curtail that. Have you got the police involved? Well, not, a, not as of yet, and that's why we went with the warning this week on our town website and town Facebook page to let the residents know that uh, we won't be putting up with this any, uh, any longer. Uh, we certainly value our operators. We're all professional people and do a fantastic job on our roads, and uh, they need to be protected, and uh, the town management and council are, are going to do that. Deputy Mayor Brown, is there something about the weather in Grand Falls of Windsor this winter that's just making the situation worse and more frustrating for everyone? No, I think we've had almost as many snowfalls as we had the previous winter, but I think the, uh, the uh, fluctuation in temperatures has resulted in uh, the ice uh, forming into big chunks, and uh, some of those chunks end up in our residents' driveways. And like I said, there are big chunks of snow, and probably unreasonable for some residents to have to move them. But uh, there's a simple way to deal with that. Just phone our emergency number that's on our town website and our town Facebook page. And uh, council or town management will deal with that issue immediately. And, and you haven't changed your snow plowing operations in any way. So there's nothing really that you can pinpoint as the uh, source of the problem. No, absolutely not. I mean, uh, in fact, most people, most residents, I would, uh, I would guess, are, are pleased with our snow clearing operations. We did have, we did have some issues during our first snowfall where we were a long time getting out on the roads. But since then, uh, we've been on it uh, immediately. And like I said, most residents are pleased, uh, with the, a few exceptions, obviously. And with those exceptions, what's been the impact on the drivers? Well, initially, when uh, the driver is going along doing his job, and all of a sudden, at the corner of his eye, he sees an individual uh, running along that heavy piece of equipment. Uh, it actually frightens them initially, and and of course, then they got to stop the piece of equipment. And, uh, probably not normally where they would stop it, because their first instinct is to protect the guy or girl running alongside that piece of equipment. So it's a scary, scary moment for operators when this happens. And uh, what is the town planning to do about this? Well, if it continues, uh, like I said, our, our first uh, our first goal here is to protect our operators. If it continues to happen, well, we'll take the necessary action to uh, to stop it. Like cameras, I think that was a suggestion made, putting cameras on the plows. Yeah, that's one suggestion council has been talking about for quite some time, and I think in the coming, uh, if not next winter, we'll see that, certainly the following winter. But uh, that would be one way to alleviate it. But we got a uh, four-person uh, municipal police force, so we're going to uh, touch base with those guys and ensure that they uh, spend a little, more time, a little more time around our operators when they're, when they're doing their work to try to avoid these instances. Mike Brown, Deputy Mayor of Grand Falls, Windsor, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Debbie.
Now to the United States. There are more calls today for Virginia's Democratic governor and his attorney general to resign over their admission that they wore blackface in the 1980s. And it's coming from people right across the political spectrum in the U.S. Civil rights leader Al Sharpton is one of those voices. He reiterated his calls at a service in Richmond today. Blackface represents a deeper problem where people felt they could dehumanize and humiliate people based on their inferiority. Now, Governor Ralph Northam and his Attorney General Mark Herring are just two of the three of the state's top Democrats embroiled in scandals. There's also Lieutenant Governor, as they say in the United States, Justin Fairfax, who was accused of sexually assaulting a woman 15 years ago. Fairfax and Herring are in line to take over as governor in that order should Northam step down. The third in line is a Republican. State House Speaker Kirk Cox says he has never worn blackface. A national survey released today says child care costs across Canada is, quote, astronomical. Not surprising, given the conversation Anthony had with some parents earlier in the week. For many, daycare is the second highest household expense after mortgage payments. The report from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives shows that cost varies widely in each province. Parents in Quebec get the best deal at $200 a month. In Manitoba and Prince Edward Island, space costs between $600 and $700 per child. Parents in Calgary, Vancouver and Toronto paying up to $1,700 a month. Prices in this province vary widely, though the province says it has created 1,000 new lower-cost daycare spaces. Help may be on the way. The federal government says it will spend $7.5 billion subsidizing child care over the next 10 years. Hi, my name is Billy. I lost my arm in a farming accident in 1996. We're checking back in with people who have overcome some major life challenges. Come on! There's people who went through a lot slighter accidents and turned out a lot worse than I did. I knew I was very lucky to be alive. This is my story. 
a new series with segments every two weeks on Here and Now. And this is my story. Billy Woods, coming up on February 13th. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Welcome back, everyone. Time to get a better sense of what's ahead in the weekend forecast. Right, but first... Oh. oh, right. It is Thursday, which means we have another new member of our Weather Wiz Kid Club. Yes. Take a look at this. So this is Aliana Vale Neal. She is our newest member, and she is grade two at oh. Coley's Point Primary. So there's her uh, her drawing there of a snowman and her, her picture in the corner there. Oh, nicely <laughs> done, Aliana. Yeah, she did a great job. So you'll get a, a postcard in the mail. I'll send it to your school, and then... Uh, yeah, you'll get that within the next little bit. Yeah, I wish. I actually wish we had snow to make snow people, <laughs> or a snowshoe, or something. Go to Labrador. <laughs> yes, uh, certainly there is where you're going to find tons of snow. But uh, temperatures are cooling down, and that means we're going to see that potential for snow squalls. So if we take a look at where that cold air is right now, it's uh, sitting through uh, most of central Canada, so we're up through. Um, Essentially, Saskatchewan, we're going to see that uh, cooler air make its way in through the weekend. The coldest air will be over Labrador, and uh, with that is why we're going to see the snow squalls develop. So we can see that uh, change into the northwesterly flow through the day on Saturday. Model already picking up on that potential for snow squalls. We could see it down through the southern half of Newfoundland and parts of the Avalon as well. And then those windy conditions will stay up through Labrador. So we are going to see that potential for more snow and blowing snow right through the day on Saturday. And then again, there's those snow squalls. So even through the morning on Sunday, it looks like even into Monday is where we're going to see those snow squalls. So here's a look at the temperatures. Again, those windy conditions will continue. Temperatures are going to fall. So this is a morning high essentially for central uh, and eastern Newfoundland as well as the Avalon at six degrees. Temperatures will drop into the afternoon, so everything will change back over to snow. And then we're going to see those snow squalls along the west coast. And then temperature up through Nain, though, look at that. Minus four will be your afternoon high on Saturday. Same for Cartwright, sitting around minus one. And then the straits are actually going to hover around the one degree mark through the day. Lab City hanging on to those windy conditions and minus 18 through the day. So there's a look at that low pressure system. It is offshore, but but in behind that with those strong winds continuing through Sunday uh, afternoon, even into Monday, we're going to see those snow squall potentials and then uh, eventually things will clear out overnight and into Saturday or into Tuesday is when we'll finally see a little bit of a break from that snow squall activity. So taking a look at your five day forecast for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland again, a wintry mix tomorrow. Uh, towards the evening hours and then in the morning everything will uh, change over to snow for Saturday going down to minus nine is your overnight low Saturday staying or rather Sunday staying quite chilly minus seven with those windy conditions and then again into Monday minus eight that sunshine finally making an appearance by the time Tuesday rolls around for central Newfoundland about two to four centimeters of either snow or ice pellets through the afternoon changing through to freezing rain to rain overnight as you can see that temperature climbing to four degrees Saturday hovering around one but then dropping dramatically down to the minus uh, 14 degree range with those windy conditions continuing right through Sunday again potential for a few snow squalls and then western Newfoundland certainly snow squalls right through Monday with that potential for some more flurries moving in on Tuesday. Up through eastern Labrador, 15 to 25 centimeters of snow is a good bet. Those winds really won't pick up, though, until Saturday evening. Minus 10 is your afternoon high there, staying uh, within a couple of degrees of that right through Monday. And then sunshine returning on Tuesday. And then for western Labrador, same thing, 15 to 25 centimeters. More snow through Saturday and Sunday, likely uh, not as intense, though, but could pick up another uh, 5, maybe even 10 centimeters of snow. So just before we uh, go to break there, have another wonderful weather photo for you. The sky is on fire somewhere in the Avalon, on the Avalon. Right. Okay. What are all those? <laughs> are they lamps? lamps? <laughs> yes, they are. I tried to take it out of the picture. So uh -huh. I couldn't figure out where it was. <laughs> well, take a guess and I will tell you who took this wonderful photo when we come back. Okay.
Well, welcome back. Um, I guess we should take a look at what's going on in a certain part of Canada with respect to the weather. You could call it the ultimate icebreaker. Check this out. <laughs> People in London, Ontario had to deal with the after effects of yesterday's freezing rain. And clearly <laughs> had a little fun with their frozen car windows posting these videos to Twitter. Even the police uh, took a crack at this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ontario Provincial Police. They also remind everyone if you're going to do this, <laughs> make sure to roll the window down. <laughs> that Although, is not a bad I idea. I suspect if you don't, you'll probably have the video that is most likely to go viral. <laughs> Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. But that's that same system that uh, brought all that freezing rain is what's our weather maker. All right. Okay. Just so you know. So we could be posting videos of ourselves doing that. Potentially if you do it through the overnight, right. yeah. Absolutely. You first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, let's take a look at uh, our weather photo of the day today. A beautiful sky. I just love when we get photos like this. And you didn't but have an idea. I was going to say Mount Pearl, but... You know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I, mean, I could see the street lights. Yeah. And, of course, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, definitely in St. John's. And this photo is taken uh, actually in Kemmount Terrace. Oh, fiery it, sunrise. It yes. is stunning. It is. Beautiful sunrises. We'll see. Probably another one of those. But you never <laughs> pick them in St. John's, so just to does enter my consciousness. Yeah, right. <laughs> thank Thanks. you. Thank yeah. you so much, Kim Keats, for sending that photo in. If you had any you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So now we'll prepare for the uh, shopping Armageddon in the grocery stores <laughs> tomorrow because, of course, <laughs> the end of the world is coming and the grocery stores will be packed with people. Oh, Get in dear. Early. We're going Dramatic. in. <laughs> Have a great night. <laughs> see you. Well. Good night.